Welcome to episode 34 of Better Than Barrio. Hi, this is Future Me. Just jump in for a quick message about the episode. Unfortunately, after initially rendering this episode, we noticed some major corruption and frame drops had occurred during the recording of the match video. The footage just wasn't viewable. By combining any footage that was useful from the match and splicing it together with the footage from the in-game highlights option, I've been able to splice together a highlight section. But it's not as in-depth and not as polished as normal. Sorry about that. It was either that or skip the episode completely. We should be back to normal for the next episode. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not drop this video a like? I would really appreciate it. Anyway, I'll hand back to pass me. It wasn't a high scoring round this time, so there haven't been many changes. Bantam 2708 remains in the lead. Stafford Bantam's point moves him up to joint second, while Bruce Bannister moves up one place to joint stick. Lord Bobby drops two places to 14th, where he's joined by Bronco, who moves up one place, while Bradford moves up one place to joint 20th. As always, the links to the next entry thread and the rules can be found in the description. And with that, let's roll the titles. Welcome to Game Week 34 in Skybet League 2. Today we travel to the Abbey Stadium to take on Cambridge United. Cambridge currently sixth, but we're in strong form, although they have drawn their last two matches. Our form has been a bit inconsistent, so if we can extend Cambridge's run to three draws, then that would be a result I'd be happy with. Before we look at the team news and today's lineups, let's check in on what happened between episodes. So my director of football has been doing another round of attempted contract renewals. The first of these has ended in failure again though. Smith first still doesn't want to sign a new deal. In better news however, he got Riley to sign a new deal and he had him agree to take a small pay cut from 2.5k to 2.3k. He also dropped his playing time from being a regular starter to fringe player. His ability to persuade players to sign new deals didn't last long though, with McCartan rejecting the deal he was offered. It was on the same wages but would have bumped his agreed playing time up. Breaking away from contract renewals, we had a new set Pritchard is now back in training, following his knee ligament injury. He obviously isn't ready to start matches, but hopefully can give some minutes off the bench and we'll have him ready for starts fairly soon. Now if we look at his stats, we do see the injury has had an impact on him. First up we have potential ability. This has fallen by half a star from 4 star to 3.5 star. This is something we can live with. At 26, he was unlikely to peak above his current ability of 3.5 star anyway. More worrying are the negative traits he has developed. Recent decline is to be expected with injury and we should be able to get that back as he gets his fitness up. Endurance should be the same as well. Athleticism is always tougher to get back and worst of all he's developed a big game negative trait. This most likely wasn't due to the injury but strangely I didn't notice him having issues in big games before the injury. Unless of course no League 2 match is considered a big game. If you look at his attributes we can see why he has some of these negatives. His technicals and mentals are unaffected but let's look at his physicals. So as you can see, his agility is the same as the start of the season, but it's got a down arrow, so it means we've lost any improvements we've done. His balance has dropped by one, and his stamina has also dropped by two. Hopefully these are short-term drops that we can regain, but there's not much of the season left to do that. As mentioned last episode, Gibson was in talks to go on loan to Dumbarton. That deal has now been confirmed, and they are paying 50% of his wages. Jorge Sharikora, and yes, actually this time I looked up how to say his name, but I almost certainly still butchered it, has turned down our latest offer and looks like he'd leave at the end of the season. Also turned down a deal is Adam Henley, with Riley having signed for another year. This may be less important, as we have two right backs, so we just need to bring in another left back to compete with Woods. Ismail also rejected a deal. I thought maybe with the run he'd been getting, he would have reconsidered, but apparently not. Chances of us having no wings next season continues to increase. Two of our youth prospects have signed their first pro deals. Goldthorpe I'm especially happy about, but hopefully Cousin Dawson can also kick on from here. Reeves has agreed a new deal, and he's taken a £200 pay cut along with that. With the chance of getting cooked to join a permanent deal being 50 50 we may have to build our midfield around reefs and with the chances of us having to go to a wingless system he will be vital next up we have daniel francis signing his first pro deal he's a fullback that my head of youth development has high hopes for so this is good news and finally we have news that Akpan has a cold with the lack of depth we have in some positions i can't really risk it spreading so i sent him home to recover he will be back in three to four days so back to today's team news cambridge have taft as doubt while it says we have no team news in reality we know we're missing henley for the next seven weeks so we see Wood and O'Connor return to start 11, with Ben Richard Everton dropping to the bench and starting out the matchday squad altogether. So starting 11 is McGee in goal, Mella, O'Connor, Powdy and Wood in defence. Reason Cook in midfield, Ismail keeps his place on the wing and is joined by Middleton, and it's Novak and McCartan up top. On the bench we have a Donald, Goldthorpe, Donaldson and French, alongside Ben Richard Everton, DeVitt and Pritchard. Ideally these two come on around the 70th minute to get some minutes under their belts to aid their return from injury. So 7 minutes in, Wood got the ball and played down the line to Novak. Novak played a wonderful ball into Middleton. We were driving the box and drilled it past the goalkeeper. Brilliant finish. And just to warn you, you'll be getting a few of these three angles in one shot replays due to the recording issue. You may need to rewind a few times to take them all in. To aid you, each highlight is chapter so you can skip back with these. 
And as you can see, it's a great ball for Novak and equally good run for Milton. However, he still has a lot to do when he takes the shot because the defender has kept up just enough to prevent him from cutting inside. That means the shot is from the tight angle. He finishes brilliantly with a hard and true shot, though. A minute later, we have a throw. Mayer throws it long to Novak and nods it to Ismail, who controls it and then smashes it home with his right foot. After the Stevenage game, this was just the start we needed to instill some confidence. Mayer's throw managed to cut out the first defender, which leaves Novak well placed to win the ball. It's headed to the D, it's perfectly weighted, and Ismail just needs to touch with his left to set him up for the shot on the right, and he guides it past the keeper and into the corner. Four minutes later, we should have been three up. Milton broke down the wing, played it into Novak, who unselfishly plays it into McCartan, who looked like he had to score, but the keeper saved it. So the interchange change in this first 12 minutes has been fantastic. Lots of quick direct pass with intent. Just a shame about the finish on this one. If my carton had placed it either side of the keeper, it was a goal. On the 30th minute, we did get third. Milton beats his man, but the cross is cleared. It falls to Cook, who shot Ricochet off the back of Novak, and then Reeves at the edge of the box passes it past the keeper. While Milton's initial play was good and Reeves' finish was calm and correct, between that it was a messy goal. I'm showing the goal notification I recovered from the original corrupted footage, and as you can see, the assist was initially awarded to Cook. However, as we'll see later on, Novak ends up being given it. As neither intended to set up Reeves, I'm not sure either deserve it, especially Novak as it hits him on the back and he knows nothing about it. Mind you, the keeper's already died for Cook's shot and is still on the ground when Reeves strikes it, so maybe they do both deserve an assist. On half time, then they make it four. Mello looks over the top for Ismail, but it's too long. Darling picks it up and clears it across the field, but Milton intercepts. He then plays it out to Wood, who puts it across to the back post where Ismail's got around the back, but he does make good contact. Initially, Ismail does well. It's his pressure that forced the mistake from Darling. Darling should have just hoofed it long. The minute it goes across the field, though, he's in trouble because Milton's taking up a good position. When Milton gets the ball, you expect him to take on defender based on how well he's played this half. But he catches Cambridge by surprise by playing it out to Wood. Equally, Wood hitting the cross early and from deep sees the back four caught asleep. And that allows Ismail's clever run to let him get in behind. Ismail's technique on the shot lets him down. He gets it all wrong and it goes softly into the keeper's grasp. The half-time stats showed a dominating performance. We had 10 shots there too. We hit the target 6 times to score from 3 of those, which is clinical. We had 1 clear-cut chance and 4 half chances. Cambridge did edge possession, and our passing success rate of 73% is about as low as I've seen it all season, but that might be because our players are looking for forward passes more than normal. On the flip side, our headless run is 62%, which is much higher than normal. We won 11 of the 12 tackles we made as well. Our best player was Novak on an 8.7. He's been involved in everything that we did in that first half. Our worst was Wood, who's only completed 57% of his passes. As the team analysis section makes clear, it's been a contrast in half for our fullbacks. While Wood has lost possession of most of anyone on the pitch, Meadow has won it back more than anyone else. The second half didn't get off to a good start. They dominated possession and made that count on the 53rd minute with a well-worked goal. Coco pulled it back to Maris, who whipped in a devilish ball for Lamb to head home. Wood would be disappointed. He had him covered but switched off. It's certainly good build-up play and the ball is as good as you will see, but Wood should have dealt with it. The goal kind of sums up how we played the whole second half. Cambridge dominated and we struggled to get on the ball. Lucky this was the only big chance they created. It was a tense second half as if they'd got that second I could have seen them snatching a win. Didn't come and we played out for a 3-1 win. It's a real Jekyll and high performance. We were just lucky that our best was way better than our worst. The stats show how much it swung. It ended up with them having 13 shots to our 14. They had 11 on target to our 8 and they hit the woodwork once. We did end up having more possession than them although it didn't feel like that while watching it. We still struggled with our passing and our headers one fell in the second half as well. Novak was our best player on a 9, Mello was our worst on 6.5. Only positive second half was we got some minutes into Pritchard and Devitt and gave Mello a rest. So time to check out this week's scores and see how it impacts the table. The loss for Cambridge was damaged by their promotion hopes. They fall 2 places 8th and out of the playoff positions. Cheltenham won 3-0 against Leighton Orient. Cheltenham move up 1 place to 7th. Crawley beat Bottom Club Carlisle 3-1 and that sees Crawley leap up 3 places to 4th. Grimsby and Morecambe shared a 0-0 draw. Exeter rescued a 1-0 draw against Macclesfield that sees them open for 1 point lead over Carlisle. Mansfield and Newport also had a 1-0 draw. Oldham took an early lead against Forest Green. Bailey equalised just after half time before scoring the winner 4 minutes into injury time. Plymouth beat Crew 2-0. Plymouth stay in 3rd while Crew for one place to 10th. Colchester went to Port Vale but were only able to get a 1-0 draw. That drops Colchester down one place to 6th. Demons beat Seoul for 2-0 and move up one place to 9th. Twinder can only draw 2-0 at home to Scunthorpe which sees them for one place to 5th and Walsall beat Northampton 2-1.
So before we wrap up, the first thing we'll do is check in on our minimum possible finish again. As you can see, that's now up to 14th, so we're edging closer to doing better than Barrier. As discussed last time, we need five wins and a draw to guarantee that. I actually wasn't expecting one of those wins to come against Cambridge. I was hoping that maybe we'll get the draw we needed. So now we need four wins and a draw, which could be possible over the next five games. All but Plymouth should be an easy win, and maybe we can get a draw against the informed Plymouth. So our next match is away at Newport County. Newport are 13th, but I've been in decent form recently. They're missing Amund and Dimitriou. We are really only missing Henley. This will take place on Wednesday 2nd September at 7pm BST. For those of you taking part in the Prediction League, the entries are can be found in the description. And with that, if you enjoyed the video, please drop us a like. Much appreciated and helps the video get discovered. Also, if 90% of you aren't subscribed, so why not remedy that? It's free and you will be amongst the first to know whenever the next video goes up. And with that, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.